Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Akkad and Coca Report. I'm your host, Michelle Akkad. Our guest today is Terence Keeley, Professor uh, Emeritus of Clinical Biochemistry at the University of Buckingham in the United Kingdom, where he served as Vice Chancellor until 2014. He is also currently a research fellow at the Cato Institute. Professor Keeley trained in medicine at Barts Hospital in London and obtained his doctorate at Oxford University, following which he pursued a career in clinical biochemistry research before joining the faculty at Buckingham University. He's the author of three books, the first published in 1996 entitled The Economic Laws of Scientific Research is a sweeping exploration of the relationship between government and science and argues against public funding of scientific research. The second book, Science, Sex and Profits, published in 2008, continues the same theme and develops the notion that science is not a public good, but is organized around what he terms invisible colleges. His third book, Breakfast is Your Most Dangerous Meal, was published in, published in 2014 and links government intervention to very unhealthy nutritional advice. Terence Skeely, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. <laughs> Delighted to have you. So uh, uh, we're going to focus on today's episode on the, the themes that you develop in your, your first two books. And I've read the first book. I really love it. It's just wonderful. It, it has a, a very rich historical perspective on the relationship between government and science. You, you go all the way back to antiquity. It, it's absolutely fascinating. And then there's a lot of empirical data, a lot of theoretical work that you discuss. It, it's absolutely magnificent. I'm looking forward to reading the second book. But let's plunge into the topic. And why don't you tell us what is the main argument to support the funding of science by governments? Well. The main argument to support the funding of science by government is that basic science in particular is very, very important to applied science, but no one will pay for basic science other than the government. That's the standard argument. The trouble with that argument is that there is absolutely no empirical evidence whatsoever throughout the entire sweep of history that the government funding of science has ever stimulated economic growth. I do believe, by the way, there is a place for governments to fund science, and so we're going to come to that, I'm sure. But it is a complete myth that governments have to fund science for reasons of economic growth. That is a quite narrow argument. It's actually the most important argument because 99% of people believe that governments fund science to promote economic growth. And it's a complete myth. What is interesting is where the myth comes from. And it comes from, in particular, a key paper written by a, a Nobel laureate called Kenneth Arrow in 1962. And if you look at the current issue of The Economist, so you and I are talking today on a Saturday, I don't know when this program is going to go out, but yesterday um, The Economist came out and it would come out of course in the States as well. And there's a three page article there on the government funding of R&D. It's, it's fascinating, it's just like you, you and I are talking about. And they start off with this paper by Arrow. And rightly so. Everything is based on this one paper by Arrow. And what happened is this, it's very straightforward. In 1957, the Soviets launched Sputnik and everyone was terrified that the Russians had got a lead in space and that therefore the Americans had been left behind and therefore they should copy the Russians and the government should invest in science in a really big way. Because what's often forgotten until the Second World War, the American government basically didn't fund science. I mean, it's as simple as that. Um, and the problem that the American government had with all this huge investment in science is it seemed to show that the free market wasn't working and that the Soviets had got something right, which the Americans had got wrong. Mm -hmm. And so they went to the Rand Corporation, which was a lobby group for funding of science. And they said, we want you to, prov to provide an intellectual justification for the government to fund science within a free market. So we want you to show that this is the one exception, but otherwise than that, free markets work. And the Rand Corporation paid two great economists, one Richard Nelson and one Ken Arrow, to write their papers. And one doesn't want to sound rude, but their papers are scams. By the way, Richard Nelson has completely admitted to that, and he, he completely retracted. And what they do, these economists, it's very, it's very cunning, actually. There are two sorts of economy in the world. There's the real economy that you and I live in every day, where companies compete against each other 
amongst other things, by doing research and development. The company that doesn't do R&D is going to go bust. But there's this other economy, this mythical economy that economists have invented called perfectly competitive markets. Now, perfectly competitive markets are a very interesting intellectual model. There's no question about that. But one of the things about them is that there's no R&D in them. I won't go into it now, though I'm very happy to show you how to get into that literature. But the whole point about competitive, perfectly competitive markets is that no one does R&D. You can't, by definition. And so what Richard Nelson and Ken Arrow did is said, look, in perfectly competitive markets, as defined here, nobody does R&D. Therefore, governments should fund R&D. The trouble is we don't live in perfectly competitive markets. We live in real markets. And no one has ever shown in real markets that governments need to fund science for economic reasons. But everyone has totally accepted the Ken Arrow paper because it suits every vested interest. Governments love funding science because it makes them look like medieval princes funding patrons of art. Scientists love governments funding science because it's money really without any real commitment to, uh, to an obligation. Companies love corporate welfare. They don't care where it comes from. If government wants to fund their R&D, that's just great. And universities love government funding of science for very obvious reasons. So because there is no vested interest opposed to the government funding of science, Ken Arrow's completely false argument has been allowed to trump everyone else. But actually, there is no evidence, and there can't be any evidence, that government should fund science because it's based on a misapplication of a fictitious economic model. You know, th this is fascinating. Uh Kenneth Arrow is really uh, is my nemesis because he wrote a, another, you may be familiar with it, a, a very seminal paper that completely destroyed medicine and healthcare, where he said that it was in 1963, it's about health insurance and why, uh, again, me the medical market is, uh, is, a, is not a competitive market according to his model, and therefore government should intervene to make sure that doctors are licensed and insurance is provided because in, you know health insurance will not step up and soon after you had medicare so it was the justification for the passage of medicare and and the massive involvement of government in, in health well ken arrow was really quite naughty in the 62 paper i'm talking about there's actually a statement he makes that only the soviet union knows how to run right. an optimal economy and that the reason the Soviet Union have beaten the Americans into space is that basically they're going to be richer than everybody else. And he was going through a very Marxist phase. But to use a fictitious economic model, he knew, he knew two very important things. 99.99% of people have no idea how to read an economics paper. And why should they? And of the remaining 0.01%, they're all university professors, and they're not going to say that governments should fund science because right. people will stop talking to them in the faculty clubs. <laughs> and so Ken Arrow knew that, and therefore he knew he could do whatever he wanted and no one would ever challenge him. Richard Nelson did. Richard Nelson wrote similar papers and then recanted. Uh, and, the, and the result was that Richard Nelson did not win a Nobel Prize, but Ken Arrow, who said all the right things, did win a Nobel Prize. Richard Nelson's still alive and he's a very good man, but it's all fiction. Let's talk about um, the, the term that they use uh, to, to, to explain why science is not, uh, you know, doesn't fit in the competitive market. This, this idea of science as a public good and what that means and, and how they argue that point. Well, it's very simple. A public good means, by the way, the economists define it. Two terms, it has to be non, I, these terms are easy to understand. Let me just, let me just express these terms and explain how easy sure. they are to understand. Um, knowledge, they say, is non-rivalrous and non-excludable, by which they mean it's non-rivalrous. And this is true. This statement is true. So it's non-rivalrous. So there's no rivalry over it. So if I apply the laws of thermodynamics in my experiment and you apply the laws of thermodynamics in your experiment, we're not diminished in any way. There's no rivalry. So knowledge is non-rivalrous. We know that. Unlike, for example, a pencil or a pen. This is rivalrous. This is a piece of private property because either I own this pen or you own this pen. We can't both own it. But when it comes to knowledge, it's completely non-rivalrous. On the other hand, the other aspect of a private good, as opposed to a public good, is what's called excludability. So a private good is excludable. This pen is excludable. If you try to take it from me, I will punch you on the nose and the law will protect me. This is an excludable thing. So this is uh, this is non-rivalrous, this, this is rivalrous and excludable, it's therefore private property. Knowledge, they say, is non-rivalrous and also non-excludable. That is to say, 
I do a piece of science and it's published in the journals or my patent is published, everyone can copy me and therefore I can't keep the knowledge to myself. And that's the big myth. There was a great man, a chemist called Michael Polanyi, and he showed that all knowledge is tacit. Why? We're all doctors here, or scientists. I, I'm, I'm an MD and a PhD, so I don't know whether the audience is mainly MDs or PhDs, but I reach out to both of them. Why do we spend so many years learning to be MDs and so many years learning to be PhDs? If knowledge was truly uh, non-excludable, as the fictitious story goes, I could just pick up any normal person off the street could just pick up a textbook of medicine or pick up the journal of biological chemistry and immediately understand everything within it. That's a load of nonsense. It takes years to become a good scientist. It takes years to become a good doctor because you have to learn all this tacit knowledge. And we call it tacit because it's the opposite of explicit. If knowledge were explicit, you could pick up a textbook of medicine and immediately practice medicine. Right. But knowledge is tacit. There's stuff that you simply can't write down. You've got to do the experiment yourself. You've got to see the patients yourself. Mm -hmm. Knowledge is tacit and is therefore completely excludable. And therefore, it is not a public good. And we call it, my friend Martin Ricketts and I, Professor of Economics at Buckingham, we call it a contribution good, which is very important. What it means is you can't access the science of other people until you've done your own science, by which you then acquire the tacit knowledge to understand their research. So only nuclear physicists can read papers in nuclear physics, etc. Right. And the nuclear physics you do to get to that level of knowledge is your contribution to science. You then take knowledge out from other people, of course you do, but the price is the knowledge you put in and therefore governments don't need to fund it. It's a contribution good. It's not a private good, it's not a public good. It's this unique type of good called a contribution good. Science is accessible only by fellow scientists and the price they pay to access it is the research they themselves contribute into the pool of knowledge. This is fascinating. And that's what you, what you uh, mean by when you talk about invisible colleges Meaning exactly. it's, it's these groups of, of people who share the same interest and have developed over the years the experience to be able to understand what, 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 they, what they're talking about. Yes, and the one thing scientists and doctors have discovered is they benefit from talking to each other. If, if, if you are working alone, the chances of making a discovery are fairly slim. If there are 10 of you sharing knowledge, mm -hmm. then the chances of making discovery are much greater. And you can all benefit if there are 10 of you, because if you actually do the math, if everybody, by working with everyone else, now has 10 bits of knowledge, and if new discoveries come from the reorganization of those different bits of knowledge, then you have, I'm actually telling an untruth now, it's not this, it's not 10 to the power of 10 different combinations, it's a different formula, but let's pretend mm -hmm. it's 10 mm -hmm. to the power of 10. Mm -hmm. If 10 people come together and share knowledge, every single one of them can go off and make an advance uh, every single one of them made about by the way you can reorganize those 10 different bits of knowledge. And so all scientists come together, all sensible scientists to share knowledge in the various societies and conferences and journals, because everyone benefits by sharing knowledge, everyone. Right. To go back and just clarify on the, the question of the argument, the public good argument that they make. So their point is that because in their view, science is a public good and non-excludable and non-rivalrous, then there'd be no incentive for the private sector to, to invest in science because the, the, the knowledge would be stolen or be acquired at very low cost by the competition. That is exactly and, the argument. Right. And of course, what really troubles these people is if you go and look at American history before 1940, America had become the richest country in the world by 1890. Mm -hmm. So it was the most technologically advanced country in the world by 1890, no government funding of science. Mm -hmm. And until 1940, no government funding of science, but you have Edison, you have the Wright mm -hmm. brothers, you have Tesla, I mean, American technology and science are fantastic by 1940, all without the funding of government, by, by government of science. And so the, the problem with the, the standard argument, just look around you. Do you think Microsoft doesn't do research? I mean, these IT companies are pouring literally billions into research. It's just not true. Knowledge is actually tacit and actually leaks out quite slowly, as, as it turns out. I mean, one could go into that, but it's a complete myth that government that country that companies don't fund science for fear of other people because because it's the other way around companies do science to access the research of others in fact right i can uh, I, I completely agree but i can still see some people thinking that okay maybe in the 19th century it was possible because you know uh, science and technology were still at a sort of a low level of development 
and now it's so complex and requires so much um, you know, funding and it is so complicated that really you can't expect the private sector, especially to do very pure research where you need huge telescopes or you need um, things that, or, or and, and there's, the investment would be on such a long-term scale that that the, the, the private sector, which is very, according, again, according to, to this uh, received wisdom, is so interested and focused on immediate profits that they're not going to do, they're not going to invest in what require, seems to be requiring so much money and is being so complex. Yes, I mean, the, the trouble with that is uh, there are a number of troubles with that. First of all, you can show empirically that the private sector spends something like 7% of its R&D on pure science. And there's a reason for that. Companies that neglect pure science suffer. Companies that fund pure science flourish. And the reason for that is not so much the pure science that the scientists are doing in-house, by the way. It's the fact that if you have pure scientists in-house, they then can access all the advances being made across the globe. No one else can do that for you. You have to be a scientist to read these papers. And so by employing pure scientists and allowing them to do science, you end up essentially with in-house consultants who are bringing you up to date with all that's going on in the world. The other problem is it's a complete myth, the so-called linear model where you go from pure science to applied science to economic growth, actually an awful lot of pure science is actually made, the discoveries are made by the applied scientists who then discover, you mentioned radio astronomy. How do we know that the stars produce radio waves? It wasn't a group of people in the university lab saying, let's look to see, it was actually came out of Bell Labs. You had these engineers trying to work out what all this background noise was coming from. Turned out it was coming from the stars and indeed the background radiation from the Big Bang. So radio astronomy came out of the telephone industry and you can reproduce this example endlessly. And so the idea that pure science feeds into, into applied science is actually a very cunning myth that scientists put forward to help justify the government funding of their science. But if you look at countries like, say, South Korea or Taiwan or Japan, and what's interesting about those countries is how well they've handled the COVID epidemic, by the way, certainly much better than Britain or America, their, their science is still largely privately funded. But you go to Taiwan or Japan or uh, less Japan now, because since they had their economic crisis, they've sort of softened a bit. But if you look at Taiwan and South Korea, fantastically successful handling of COVID amongst other things, fantastically successful science and technology, and they're still largely privately funded. It's, what, it's one of the big myths that private funding, that public funding of pure science leads to economic growth. Actually, the countries that try to show that were countries like Russia or India, where the government funded a lot of pure science and they got precisely zero economic growth out of it. Mm -hmm. it's very interesting. In your book, so on that, that linear model that you just mentioned, where the idea is that for, you need the basic science first bec before you can develop the technology and then you get the economic growth. Um, you, you, in the part of your book where you talk about uh, the industrial revolution, it, it was fascinating how many uh, important huge advances like the steam engine and whatnot didn't come from people knowing that Boyle had discovered Boyle's law you know, a century before and then had applied this, this insight can you, can you talk a little bit about, about well, this? I mean, you're, this? you're absolutely right. Um, the, what, it was exactly the, way, the other way around. Uh, what happened was that essentially the gas scientists, as they were called in those days, saw what the engineers were doing with the steam engines, uh, which of course in those days were vacuums, by the way. You let steam into a cylinder, you then cooled the cylinder and it sucked the piston down, very different from what we now understand as high pressure steam. And uh, according to the theories of the day, and of course people then believed in phlogiston and other mm -hmm. weird things, which of course we now know are complete rubbish. Um, according to the scientific theories of the day, steam engines shouldn't have happened. And so what then happened is the scientists went to the engineers who had just worked it out basically by tinkering, you know, does mm -hmm. this work essentially. Mm -hmm. And it was the scientists who learned things like the laws of thermodynamics Carnot, for example, Carnot came up with his laws and principles of thermodynamics by working out what the engineers had discovered in their steam engines and then saying, oh, so that's how it works. That is just one example of many. Uh, I mentioned radio astronomy. Um, you could, I mean, how do we know that pen penicillin came out of it? Because Fleming 
made an accident. It, it's so common that we just, but we don't see it because we have not programmed to see that actually science owes more to technology than technology owes to science. Right. It's really, it's absolutely fascinating. Now, what about the argument that it, it can't hurt government funding of science? Um, you just, you know, it's not a huge part of the of the budget, and and uh, you know, it's, why 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 would it hurt? This is a very pernicious argument because it sounds so clever. Why does it hurt? The answer is you have two sectors. You have the industrial sector, where scientists and technologists do things that are useful, like invent iPhones, and you have the government sector where scientists write beautiful and elegant papers that are published in scientific journals. But to a horrific degree, that knowledge, despite things like the Beidou Act, don't, doesn't actually leak out, at least not very quickly, and does not become industrially and therefore economically important, at least not for a very long time, or in the cases of places like Russia or India, never. And so if you take, and there are very few good scientists, one of the things that's important to know is that really high quality scientists are quite rare, actually. So if you take them all out of industry and put them in the universities, you'll end up with beautiful universities and lots of Nobel Prizes and fantastic citation indices and all that sort of thing. But you've taken out of the actual economy the men and women who could have actually produced the next technological leap that would have made you richer. So there's a very high price to be paid for selectively taking the best researchers out of the uh, productive economy and putting them into ivory towers. Right. Not to mention, I suppose, the the inevitable politicization politic politicization of science right once it becomes you know predominantly funded by by the government now ostensibly the government funds scientists right it doesn't directly you don't have bureaucrats funding the science i mean they, they, the money goes through institutions like the nih or the equivalent in england or there's some where supposedly it's still the, the College of Scientists that determines who is going to hold these positions that make decisions about granting the money and, and so forth. But nevertheless, I mean, I imagine that there's, I mean, we seem to see that, that there are, at least for me, I'm not, I'm not a scientist, but I see fads, scientific fads, where all of a sudden, you know, all the funding goes to these keywords. If you don't have these keywords in your research grant proposal at the NIH, Forget it. And look, just down it, the road from where you are at Stanford, there's a very great man called John Ioannidis. And he published a paper about 10 years ago, the implications of which are still shocking the entire scientific community. And it's got a title something like, Why More Than Half of All Published Papers Are Wrong. Mm -hmm. And there's huge politicization, but it's politicization by not the group you might expect. It's not so much politicians saying, do this, don't do that, although that does happen, by the way. But what you've done is by the government funding science, you've empowered peer review. And peer review means peer reviewers at the NIH or the NSF or your promotion uh, committees at your university or your um, tenure committees at your university or indeed uh, who publishes your papers, the journals. It's all peer review. The trouble with peer review is that it, peer review is not the same as reality. So the reason half of all scientific papers are false is that scientists have discovered that they can promote their careers by abusing statistics. So suddenly coffee is bad for you one day and then coffee is good for you another day. Nutrition science, 99% of papers in nutrition science, which is one I got into, as you kindly mentioned earlier, literally 99% of papers are simply worthless because it is simply the systematic abuse of statistics. Take, for example, the story that you and I were brought on, the famous pyramid, the food pyramid, mm -hmm. that we had to eat lots of carbohydrates and whatever you do, don't eat fat. But of course, we now know the best advice is almost the exact opposite. You invert your pyramid and you're more likely to live to a ripe old age. If you go into the science of that and the history of that, and there's a woman called Nina Teichholz, who wrote a book called Big Fat Surprise, and she goes into the history of how a man called Ansel Keys, an American physiologist, he set out to show that fat was bad for you. And in 1958, when he came up with the idea, it wasn't a silly idea, but the trouble was he then took control of all the peer review. So first he took control of American Heart, then he took control of NIH, 
and then you could troll NSF and then the journals and very rapidly it became impossible for a scientist to do anything for over 30 years if he did, or she didn't show that fat was bad for you. And because nutrition science is so complicated and there's so much data you can cherry pick, so scientists made entire careers out of showing that fat was bad for you when it actually <laughs> it isn't. Right. Right. And so the politicization of science comes from empowering science to report to other scientists rather than to technology. There's a very good American uh, philosopher of science who works in Arizona, and he says it's technology that keeps science honest. As long as your science is being tested against reality, technology, it's honest. But the moment science is tested by peer review, then you please the peer reviewers. And that's why science has been so corrupted in the Western world. You know, it's very interesting because the um, the peer review crisis that I think most scientists nowadays are are, are aware of. Uh, most of them still hope that it can be solved by further peer review or better peer review or whatnot. Before the 1940s, if I understand it correctly, there was very little peer review in the journals, anyways. Right? I mean, the journals had a very small audience. It was scientists writing for other scientists in the same field and there was no need for papers i mean either the papers were vetted i mean either they stood on their own or they didn't stand um but what happened is with, with the, the the massive funding of science by government since then you have an avalanche of papers an avalanche of production of phds and and doctorate studies and whatnot um I assume that a lot of it is is also sort of self-serving for the established scientists that now they have sort of a, they can encourage students to come and get PhDs and it's maybe a little cheap labor. I mean, I, I've i spent a couple of years in, in a research lab and I've sort of have seen that people who don't really have a knack for science get lured into it, um, invest years and years because it's, it has the allure of being a noble thing that, you know, the everybody should be involved in. They spend many years, they produce papers that are not very good and whatnot. And then there's a need, there's an avalanche of, of literature and it has to be filtered. And, and then there's this peer review process that does a pretty bad job. Um, and as opposed to saying, listen, this is, uh, this is it's just inflation. It's inflation of, <laughs> it's inflationary pressure. They're producing just like, as if they were printing money. It's not, they're not printing money. They're just printing papers by, by this funding, this non-competitive funding of science. It's a very good analogy. I've never heard that analogy before of inflation, but you're, it's a very good analogy. I must remember it because just as inflation, as we know from Milton Kane, um, uh, Milton Friedman, sorry, <laughs> is produced by governments printing money. Uh, so you have exactly the same phenomenon. You're absolutely right. I mean, there are journals like the PNAS, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of America. Until recently, they were not peer reviewed. Um, if you had a paper, you would submit it to one of your, and you were friendly with a fellow of the academy, then you would send it to him or her, and if they liked the paper, it got published. That was the extent of peer review. I once published a paper like that in a British journal called the Journal of Cell Science under an editor who was very, very old, and he just looked at the papers. If he liked them, he published them, and if he didn't, he didn't. There's no evidence that it didn't do well. Right. Um, so, but, but what's happened is that there's this huge inflation, to use your term, of scientists and universities and all this money. And so it just becomes a self-feeding cycle. And the only index you have is, is peer review, which is all about meeting the prejudices of the peer reviewers. And if they all believe that fat is uh, bad for you, woe betide you if you try to produce otherwise, which is why incidentally, the three great nutrition writers in America uh, are all journalists because they're spared peer review. Nina Teicholz, um, what's his name? Gary uh, Tubbs. Gary Tubbs. Oh, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. Gary Tubbs. Yeah. But also the other great chap who writes, who said, um, uh, eat plants. Um, the, Michael the plant Pollan. Guy. Yeah. And they don't agree with each other, these three, right. by the way, but that doesn't matter. The point is right. they're the most honest uh, nutrition people in America because they haven't been damaged by the academy. Isn't that ironic? And all three are journalists. Right, right. No, indeed. Um, another thing that uh, that uh, struck me in your, in your book, um, Actually, it made on in your book, in, in, in later writing that you've done, uh, an OECD um, study on the influence of government uh, funding of science and how 
Uh, tell us about that. Uh, well, what is real, and it's not just the OECD. In my later writings, I've pointed out a number of other economists have made this point. But the OECD was very, very shocked and very unhappy about it. So in 2003, it's a very funny story. 2003, the OECD, which is, of course, a congregation of all the leading Western economies, um, published a huge study called the Sources of Economic Growth in OECD Countries. That's what it was called. And they looked at about 100 different things that could have affected rates of economic growth, ranging from the percentage of women in the workforce to the rate of inflation, whatever you wanted to think about. And this was just an empirical study. And of course, it was an association rather than cause and effect. But if you look at time A, and then you see what happens 10 years later, time B, you can start to get cause and effect. And one of the things they looked at was the government funding of research and development, which is a wider category than science. And to their horror, they, and they, they were very upset by this. It was very funny. To their horror, and they admitted this quite openly, the government funding of science or government funding of R&D not only was not associated with economic growth, it seemed to damage economic growth. And they admitted that this was this phenomenon of crowding out, i.e. this is when good scientists are crowded out of the marketplace and pushed into academic science because that's where the money is. And what they concluded, although they didn't want to conclude it, they're so reluctant, in fact, they are as reluctant as you can imagine, is that it, said, it seems as if the government funding of science, or R&D, simply takes good scientists and researchers out of the productive economy into the unproductive economy, and this seems to be a mistake. And then they say, but of course it can't possibly be a mistake because theory cannot be challenged, and therefore we don't know where we are, and we're very sorry about this, and please turn over the page. It is very funny, but they're not the only government scientists who have done this. Uh, it's been done by other scientists, for example, in the Bureau of, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. There's a man called Leo I can never pronounce his surname. It's an unpronounceable surname, but I write about him. He's shown exactly the same thing. What's interesting, and there's, there are others as well, if you try writing to these people and saying, why do we meet to discuss it? Let's have a conference. Let's work out why the government funding of science is bad for you. No one wants to take part in that conversation. They are embarrassed by their findings. They, don't want, they want to publish their findings because they have to promote their own careers, but they don't want anyone to read the papers because it's just too difficult. Very strange. What, what's the? Do you see any uh, green shoots? What's what's the way out? I mean, it's oh, it's happening. It's, okay, I tell you the green shoots, and there's a All marvelous right. green shoot. No, I t no, the world is completely benign, and I'll tell you why it's benign. So it's nice to be benign. As recently as 35 years ago, 65 no, 68 percent of R and D in the United States of America was funded by the federal government. Even 35 years ago. So if you were the Ford Motor Company and you wanted to do an R&D program, you, it's hard to believe, you wrote a grant to the Department of Transportation mm -hmm. and said, please fund our R&D because if you don't fund it, we won't, and then we get overtaken by the Japanese. This is hugely reduced now. It's now down to 27% and it goes down all the time. And this is a global trend. And so there's a, it's, it's like the sort of Roman Catholic church 500 years ago, knowing secretly that there was no reason why priests shouldn't do X or Y. All governments everywhere know that the government funding of R&D is economically futile. They all know it. They never say it. You try saying it and the world descends upon you. And so very, very quietly, without a single word, every government in the world, everyone, has reduced their funding of R&D to dramatic levels. In America today, the American government funds no more R&D than it did in 1940. You're back to laissez-faire. What the American government funds is only the following things. Defense research, as it should, that is a proper public good. Um, uh, 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 environmental research, I'm not going to get into the environmental debate here, but there's no question the environment's a public good. Obviously, the government have to fund that. Health research, you could get into that, it doesn't matter what, what, what we feel about that, but health research is believed to be universally a public good. And there are one or two, uh, agriculture, but that's simply a vested interest. The only science that the American government now funds uh, that isn't seen to be a public good in, in the sense of a mission mm -hmm. is the NSF. And the NSF, I think, gets $5 billion a year. Well, frankly, that is simply to buy off a very difficult vested interest. If the NSF wasn't funded, the pages, the editorial pages of both the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times would be full of articles every day from distinguished professors explaining why this is ruining the American right. economy. So the federal government gives the NSF five billion a year just to shut the professors up. 
but and but no one believes secretly it's of any economic value they know it's not so governments universally are doing all the right things they're just not talking about it right well i i uh this is great and and i I suppose, I mean, one sign of that is uh, Elon Musk's uh, going, launching his rockets yeah. into space and, yeah. and that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, he's, he's standing in an old tradition. What, what's completely forgotten is that in the 20s and 30s, um, it was a man called Goddard. Moon, in, in fact, if you look at, at NASA stuff, you often see the word Goddard written on all these spaceships. And there's a Goddard Center just outside Washington, D.C., which, of course, I know because of uh, being at the Cato Institute. Goddard's a very big name. Goddard worked in Massachusetts. He was funded solely by philanthropists in the 1930s. He invented um, the, the, the rocket with the different bits that come off as you go up. He invented uh, the gyroscope use in rockets. He invented liquid fuels. He invented rockets. And, but for the Second World War, he would have been the first person to go around the world, you know, Sputnik. But the war came along and he was sent off to invent bazookas instead. And so all his stuff had to be used by other people. And it was copied, as we all know, by Werner von Braun and then later by NASA. And NASA's first act on being formed in 1958, by the way, was to give a million dollars to Mooney Goddard's widow to buy all the patent rights. A million dollars, a lot of money in 1958, I can mm -hmm. tell you. So but for the Second World War, the first artificial satellite would have been launched 20, 30 years earlier by Mooney Goddard from Massachusetts. So people like um, uh, Elon Musk and uh, the others, they're just following an old private initiative. Right. Um, that's great, but it, it, it's, um, it's very hopeful. At the same time, um, science naturally is very, I mean, its benefits are very pervasive and they affect every aspect of our lives. And uh, unfortunately, I think to me, to, to the extent that as a society, the general public, that we uh, have not uh, come to recognize that our increased dependence on the government for everything, healthcare, education, you know, university, this and that, you know, food, whatnot. So long as we continue to depend I think there will continue to be a push to at least um, theoretically or, or at least openly claim that government should be involved in the funding of science for all these things. You know, you know what I'm saying is that they maybe maybe um, in effect they haven't funded technology. The government is is no longer funding technology and engineering and all that, which is very good. Um, I personally wish it wouldn't fund healthcare. I mean, I think the the argument you're correct that health is viewed as a public good. Uh, in my mind, it's it's a it's a big mistake. I mean, health, my your health is your health. It's not <laughs> it's not my health. It has nothing to do with my health. I mean, it, they're really they're, it's an individual. It's a private good, health. And I wish government were not involved in it. Um, but that's kind of a it's it, it it's a bigger societal issue of how we viewed you know the role of our government in our lives. And, and to the extent that we continue as, as citizens to expect government to, to do many things for us and to fund many things in our own private lives, um, I'm, I'm concerned that science will suffer. Um, you mentioned you know, the environment and climate and, and whatnot, climate change. I mean, that's another thing where, yes, theoretically, it's, it's a public good. I mean, the, the, the climate is not going to be uh, although, I mean, one could be inventive and think about private ways that, that the private sector could take care of at least pollution, uh, environmental pollutions. I mean, there are ways where, you know, that those things could be taken care of. Um, but but the, the, the climate and the environment, I mean, it's a huge, both healthcare and the environment are sort of huge um, arguments to continue sort of uh, a very strong interventionist uh, government policy uh, yeah, in well, our lives. Um, yeah, now that is different from economic growth. So I, I, let me start off by saying I am prepared to concede as a theoretical possibility that there may be reasons why governments should fund, say, healthcare, not for economic reasons, by the way, but because there are orphan drugs or something. So let's just look at that for a second. Mm. That, so that's not about economic growth. That's about government correcting for so-called market failure. Okay, now, right. 
It's not a stupid argument. I mean, the, the most famous argument, of course, the most famous piece of that is, how do we know that cigarettes cause lung cancer? I can assure you that was not discovered by the cigarette companies who kept very quiet about it. The person who discovered it, and this is an extraordinary story that amazes me it's not better known. Let me ask you as a sort of rhetorical question, have you any idea who was it who first set out to say, we must show that cigarettes cause lung cancer? Do you, have you any idea no, who that I, person I don't. was? The most evil human who's ever lived. Adolf Hitler came to power in 1933, as we all know, totally subscribing to all the mantra of the day. So he was a vegetarian, he was a teetotaler, he believed in the environment, he believed in uh, being kind to animals, and he believed that cigarettes had to be bad for you. He just knew intuitively. So he came to power, called his epidemiologist together, and said, I just know that cigarettes are bad for you. Go and prove it. And, you know, if Hitler told you, to, <laughs> they went off. To their amazement, it, the data just fell out. Cigarettes, it's, it, this wasn't difficult stuff. You didn't need statistics. This is stuff so obvious you didn't even need statistics. You just looked at 10,000 people, 5,000 smoked and 5,000 didn't. And my goodness me, look what happened to those who died, who, who smoked. Mm. Now, the reason we don't give Hitler the credit was that Richard Dahl in England knew about all this work. It was his area. He was reading the field. But by then, nobody, literally nobody was reading the Nazi literature. So he could read the Nazi literature and basically just steal it. And, and I mean, he repeated the experiments. He didn't steal the data, but he repeated the work and claimed it for his own. Uh, because no one was going to gainsay him. And even if they were going to gainsay him, no one wanted to give Adolf Hitler any credit. So that's how Richard Dahl became so famous. But actually it was Hitler. And the reason that's an important story is it does show there are things the state can do that the private sector wouldn't do. The danger is that if the state sets up to do things the private sector doesn't do, it then displaces the charitable sector. And that's the great danger. You, know, you don't want Bill Gates saying, well, we don't need to fund the Gates Foundation anymore because that nice Mr. Biden's doing all that work for us, we'll go and do something else. So crowding out is a real problem. Of course, and here this, here's an argument, and here I'm going to be tentative because I'm not claiming to know about this. I know that government funding for science does not stimulate economic growth. I've shown that a dozen times. I know that to be true. Is the government funding of science important for health? Well, this starts to become an issue of value judgment. And there are areas here that I know no more than anyone else. And, and it's interesting in this area that everyone's a bit more tentative. There are no, it's not like Ken Arrow writing his papers that everyone mm. says, oh, this is the God has spoken. This is now a matter of debate. So you don't believe they should. By the way, I'm very sympathetic to your point of view, but others believe that's a public good and that therefore it should be funded. And here we get into areas of genuine debate sure. between equals. But can I, can I give you a counter example to your Hitler example? Sure. Do you know who, there was a big debate uh, in the uh, you know late 19th century, early 20th century, about blood pressure and whether high blood pressure was good for you or bad for you. Really? Some people, yes. Some people thought that you needed a higher blood pressure to push the blood through. If there was obstruction in the arteries, it was good to have a higher blood pressure to push the blood through. And the academic establishment was really divided on this question. And do you know who solved it? No, I never even heard of it before. So it was solved by. Uh, by the life insurance companies, the statisticians in the life insurance companies. They collected the data and they came out and they published the papers and it, they, they absolutely saw that in, in my mind, they deserve the Nobel Prize. So I, want, I, I suspect, I mean, they, they could have solved, I mean, they didn't do it, but presumably they, they might have solved the cigarette question as well. What it's, a it's very interesting of, point. I've never had that thought before. Yeah. I will now claim that thought as my own. I will see this as my own idea, because you're absolutely right. It would have fallen out of the life. The actor, the actuaries would have found you are dead right. The actuaries would have got there. We didn't need the MRC in England, and we didn't need right. Adolf Hitler in Germany. Right. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, um, on that note, uh, Professor Keeley, you are. Um, I mean, as far as I can tell, among scientists, you're the lone voice. We might say you have a monopoly on this idea of... You know, I yes. think, I do think I am the only scientist in the world who believes that government right. shouldn't fund science. But um, uh, as, as, as you know, I've tried to explain why, why, um, why that is. 
uh, what, because of the vested interest. And I think uh, it's amazing what people choose not to question when their own salaries depend on it. True. I mean, why should a rational uh, scientist yeah. question the government funding of science? Correct. I mean, it would be, it but, would be uh, irrational. That's true, but at the same time, my 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 hope is that there are many unhappy scientists, people who went into science. I, I mean, I, I project my own experience. I went into medicine, government-funded medicine makes a lot of doctors very unhappy. Yeah. So it was my 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 incentive to get out or to minimize as much as possible. I can't do it completely, but to minimize as much as possible my dependence on the government for my income. It's a little more difficult for scientists, but actually perhaps not that not that much difficult. I mean, they could join philanthropic organization and Bill Gates is, is willing to fund. Unfortunately, Bill Gates still funds, he funds primarily universities that are in, you know, and he's enmeshed with the government in, in some ways. I mean, there's this problem of big philanthropy being in cahoots with the government to, but, but nevertheless, I mean, I think if more scientists are unhappy, realize that the source of their unhappiness is the system that is unhealthy, very unhealthy at many levels, the way you've described it, that they might, um, you know, first of all, adopt your ideas and, and, uh, and embrace You're them. You're absolutely and, and, right. Yeah. I, I'm going to interrupt because, because uh, you know, no one's interested in one's own life. You know, the, the one thing we all know is that when you ask someone, how are you, you know, only mm -hmm. a bore tells you how right. they are. <laughs> so I'm not going to go on, but you're absolutely right. It, it did come out of my own eye. So I first became a libertarian when I worked as a doctor in the National Health Service in Britain, which is a, a nationalized system of healthcare. And it was, I thought it was awful the way doctors treated patients. The relationship mm -hmm. was so, the power balance was awful. Patients were right. basically supplicants. I thought, this is just no way to treat people. Right. So that made me into a libertarian. I became a scientist, not, not as a reaction against that. I always wanted to be a scientist. The medical degree was really mm -hmm. just a means to an end. Um, but I, I was unhappy I, in 1982. I remember vividly um, that the, the, sci the lab I was working in in Oxford, I did my PhD in Oxford, we were so crowded that we couldn't stay on for our postdocs or I got a couple of grants, but in the end, there just wasn't space. I mean, I understood that. Um, and I had to go to Newcastle, for, which is like Detroit, about 300 miles north of London, and then a very unhappy place. And, um, and, and I discovered, and I, so I, did, I became unhappy because I didn't want to go to Detroit. You know, I wanted to stay in right. Chicago, thank you very much. And, um, and so I started thinking, you know, why am I here? What's happening here? And that's when I began to question science. So you, it's a very perceptive point. I mean, I, I, I fell in love with science quite quickly again, but there was that moment of unhappiness that caused me to question, right. why does science work this way? Uh, Terence, do you? I will have links to your books on on the show notes. And uh, do you, you have a column with uh, with Cato, or do you, you have a? I write occasionally for Cato. I write okay. occasionally. I don't. I ought to do more regular stuff. What I'm really trying to do, and it's pouring all my efforts into this book on economic growth. I mean, I think science is the cause of all economic growth, or research is the basis right. of all economic right. growth. But I think so. Research is the most important thing we do. I mean, you. There is nothing more important than research because there's nothing more important than economic growth. Without economic growth, we'd be living in caves and dying at 30. And it comes from research. What we researchers do is the most important thing humanity does, other, of course, than mothers bringing up children, of course, which is even more important for obvious reasons. But once you've got that out of the way, it's right. people doing research. So let's be honest about it. We don't have to tell untruths about the importance of research. We don't have to pretend what the role of government funding is. Let's be honest about it and celebrate what research actually is. It's the best story going. And that's what this book I'm writing. And that's what's engrossing me at the moment. <laughs> We're absolutely looking forward to it. Thank you so much for your insights. And uh, perhaps we'll have you back when the, when the book is out. Do you have any uh, time frame or? No, it'll be a couple of years, but okay. because you know, but, but it will be out. I must do it before I die. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.